Reading read with verse 23. Judges chapter 7, verse 23. I still hear paper turning, so I'll give you a second here. Oh, our young people can be dismissed. <laughs> Judges chapter 7, verse 23. And the men of Israel gathered themselves together out of Naphtali and of Asher and out of Manasseh and pursued after the Midianites. And Gideon sent messengers throughout all Mount Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites, and take before them the waters unto Bethbara and Jordan. Then all the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and took the waters unto Bethbara and Jordan. And they took two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb, and they slew Oreb upon the rock Oreb and Zeb they slew at the winepress of Zeb and pursued Midian and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side of Jordan. Chapter 8 verse 1. And the men of Ephraim said unto him, to Gideon, Why have you served us thus that you didn't call us when you went to fight with the Midianites? And they did chide with him sharply. And he said unto them, What have I done now in comparison to you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abiezer? God hath delivered into your hands the princes of Midian, Oreb, and Zeb, and what was I able to do in comparison of you? Then their anger was abated toward him when he had said that. Gideon came to Jordan and passed over he and the three hundred men that were with him, here's my word, faint, Yet pursuing them. I want to read just a couple more just because I like what it says. And he said unto the men of Sukkoth, Give, I pray you, loaves of bread unto the people that follow me, for they be faint, and I'm pursuing after Zeba and Zalmunna, kings of Midian. And the princes of Sukkoth said, Are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna now in your hand that we should give bread to your army? Gideon said, Therefore, when the Lord has delivered Zeba and Zalmun into my hand, I'll tear your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. And he went to Penuel and spake unto them likewise. And the men of Penuel answered him as the men of Sukkoth answered him. And he spake also to the men of Penuel, saying, When I come again in peace, I will break down this tower. And the church said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated this morning. I'm going to use just for that thought in verse number four there, the last few words, faint yet pursuing. Yes. Faint yet pursuing. You see, Gideon's life is a perfect, perfect example of how God can take impossible circumstances for his servant and uh, get his glory out of impossible circumstances. Now we know the story of Gideon in the 6th chapter of uh, the book of Judges. We find, uh, matter of fact, the first verse. Let me read that to you. This is where it all started. Many times things in our life, this is where it all starts. Chapter 6, verse number 1 of Judges said, The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. We blame God, we blame the church, we blame the preacher, we bring our nephews, our in-laws, everybody else. We blame our husband, blame our wife. But Israel was in trouble with Midian because they had sinned and done evil in the sight of the Lord. Many times the things that's going on in our life is a result of the problem that is to follow many often time. But in this sixth chapter, the Bible said that the Midianites came against the children of Israel and began to wreak havoc upon them. And then the children of Israel began to cry unto God and asking God for his help. And that's where that if you remember the story, the Bible said an angel appeared unto Gideon while he was here threshing wheat. Uh, and uh, when uh, God came to him and he said, uh, Thou art a mighty man of valor. And God would use 
him to deliver Israel out of the hands of the Midianites. And the Bible tells us in the book uh, in chapter 7 how that God would accomplish this great feat. The Bible said that as uh, Gideon got his army together and began to put them together, he had like uh, some uh, 32, some thousand men together, but he was going against a hundred thousand man army. God called this shy man to lead the children of Israel into battle against an overwhelming enemy. Have you ever felt like the enemy of your soul? The battle that you're fighting is overwhelming at times. A uh, hundred thousand Midianites compared actually to Israel's army of 22,000. Have you ever felt like you've been in a fight like that? Talking about not having enough resources. Talking about being overwhelmed. The enemy's got more power than you've got. He's got more weapons than you've got. And you're fighting with this handful of an army. But the Bible says that God spoke unto Gideon and told him to go fight this battle. And the Bible said that Gideon believed God and was getting ready to go out to war. But then God makes things even more impossible. You remember the story? God pushes the limits well beyond Gideon's limits in order to bring glory to himself. You see, the Bible holds amazing lessons for uh, each one of us about God's resources and his power to supply them in our life. And I've found that one of those lessons is how God often brings us an incredible supply only after we have went beyond our own limits. When you feel like you don't have nothing left in you. When you feel like that your fight is gone. When you feel like you've took the last step that you're able to take. God comes flooding in with resources. Can I tell you no matter how tired and weary that you are of the fight today God tells us today help is on the way hallelujah to God just as we'll see in this story today you see God longs to demonstrate his power in our life not because you're a good person or I'm a good person but God desires to glorify his name. That's what life's about folks. It ain't about your new yacht and it ain't about your new motorcycle and it ain't about your new pool. It ain't about your new house or your new car. It's about God getting the glory from the life that I live today. I see four lessons in this story of Gideon today that I want to share with you as quickly as I can this morning. First of all, first thing you need to remember, you know it, but you need to be reminded Limited resources never limit God. Amen. Limited resources never limit God. Right. They tried to scare us at the first with this virus until there wasn't going to be enough vaccines. I thought God's got enough vaccination, He can vaccinate those that He needs to today. Amen? Amen. Just because we may be limited in the resources with this battle, God is not limited today. He's never limited in his resources. And he'll never be limited in his resources when he calls us to do something for him. Now, if we had been in uh, Gideon's army, we would have probably thought, Lord, I don't know what you're thinking about now, but there's only 22,000 of us and there's 100,000 of them. We don't stand a chance. And I could see them praying, Lord, we need some more horses. We need some more chariots. We need some more uh, spears. We need some more slingshots, whatever they used in those days. And you know what God did? God moved. God moved. You know how God moved? God said, you got too many. You're going to have to get rid of some of these guys and send them home. What? 22,000 men against 100,000. And you're telling us that we got too many? He tells Gideon, he said, if any of you are discouraged or distraught, if you talk to your men and they're afraid, tell them to go home. I tell you, if I'm in the battlefield, I don't need somebody, or I don't need no uh, Don Knott, Step Barney, uh, five standing beside me, scared to death and afraid to fight. I want somebody that said we may not win this thing today, but I'm going to kill as many as I can before we get out of here. We've been called to a battle, church. It's not fluffing stuff on Sunday morning. God has called us into life. He's called us into battle. There's going to be some bloodshed. There's going to be some tears. There's going to be some hard times, but that's when the people of God have got to stand up and we got to keep pursuing no matter how faint we become. So God said, take all you men, tell all those that are afraid, go home. Gideon 
said, if you'd have been there, he would have been like, what? I got 22,000 and you want me to send some home? But this is the message that God was sending to everybody in that battle. He said, those of you that have a willing spirit. There's a lot of church folk, but not all church folk have a willing spirit. A lot of people come to church, but they're not all engaged in the fight. They're getting in, they're in the fight, whether they admit it or want to believe it or not. Some people don't want to disturb the devil. Can I tell you, he was disturbed 2,000 years ago. Amen. He's already mad. Amen. I really ain't concerned about what his feelings are like. Amen. But God said that uh, everybody there, he said, for those of you that have a willing spirit, I want you to set your mind to do battle. Because you're going against an enemy that is ten times your size. You see, the Midianites was much stronger. They were much fiercer. God said they may be stronger, but then they may be more fierce. But you got something they don't. I'm on your side today. Hallelujah to God today. Now, you can't blame Gideon for wanting to have his needs supplied before he goes to battle. Now, before you go to battle, you think, have I got enough stuff to fight with? You know, if I go against a seven-foot fella and he's bigger than me and stronger than me, I'm going to be looking for a two-by-four or a tire jack or something. I'm going to knock his brains out. Somebody said, you got to fight fair. Now, when you're bigger than me, don't look for me to fight fair. I'm going to do what I can do to survive. We might even quote Jesus. You remember Jesus said no man goes to battle except he first sat down and count the cost. We might say, Lord, we've counted the cost. You've got us got down to 10,000 men against 100,000 men. This ain't making no sense to me. We read that and we think Jesus is telling us that it's foolish to undertake something without having the proper resources. Ain't that what it sounds like? Don't go to battle unless you know you can win the battle. That's not exactly what he's talking about here. I think we've got to use some good sense. But matter of fact, the statement that Jesus makes there, you see, we like to pick scriptures we like out of context, not read what he's talking about in the whole setting, the whole scene. But just before that, Jesus says, he makes a bold statement, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. You see, the Bible is not all about give me, give me, give me and blessing and blessing and blessing. Jesus said, unless you're willing to bear your own cross and come after me, you can't be my disciple. He makes it pretty clear. In order to be in God's army, in order to be engaged in this fight, we've got to be all in. We've got to be all in. Some people are in when it feels good. Some people's in when it's convenient. Some people's in when they feel like it. You've got to be in whether you feel like it or not. You've got to be in whether it's going your way or not. You've got to be all in this thing and say, Lord, come sink or swim or high water. I'm going to serve you and I'm going to follow you. See, Jesus is referring here, telling us that unless we're all in, we can't be his disciples. That means all, that means letting go of all self-reliance, forgetting about what you're able to do. Forgetting about trusting your abilities and your resources and trusting him to supply. Sometimes that's why he has to eliminate all our sources of help because we go to them before we go to him. And when he eliminates all these resources and we have to turn to him, nobody gets the glory but him. Right. And many times I believe God purposely limits our resources to ensure that he gets the glory. Yes. Yes. Now here's what made things even more impossible for Gideon. He told him, the people that are with you are still too many for me to give the Midianites into your hand lest Israel boast and say, I saved myself. Gideon must have thought, I need to stop praying every time I pray. God takes something else away from you. You ever felt like that? <laughs> I'm praying for an answer. And different things, the opposite thing seems to happen. 
Now, immediately after praying the other day, and God spoke directly, I mean, I think, I'm not talking about, I'm just believing something that's unbelievable. I'm not just saying I'm stepping out no matter what it looks like. But I'm telling you, I was agonizing. I know what this situation could turn out with for mom. And I'm praying every day, and I'm seeking God. I, every day, I'm crying my eyes out. I hate to see her in that situation. But one morning, I'm praying, and I'm fighting and wrestling and prayer, praying with God. I'm not talking about now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord to soul to keep. If I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to say, I'm not saying Lord bless this food and thank you for it. I'm talking about battling with the devil. I'm talking about praying in earnestly with God. I, I'm talking about almost like the, the pastor talked about this morning praying. I would have thought my sweat became as great drops of blood. I'm fighting for my mama. I'm praying for my mama. I said, Jesus, even you had a mama and you loved your mama. And I'm wrestling and fighting with that. Then God give me that peace. I'm in control of this. I got up. I dried my tears. I dusted myself off. And I put it in his hands. Regardless of the outcome. As soon as I got that peace, you know, human nature. Things are going to get better every day. Got a phone call first thing yesterday morning. The letter sugar drops you in a diabetic shock. Terrible night. She ain't sick enough on top of everything out then with this. We went up there and we spent all day up there yesterday making sure she eats. Hospital she was at before, just had a stroke, can't move her arm, can't hardly talk. They bring drop her plate off and walk out the door. Don't help her get the lid off, don't help her open her food. She can't open it. After a day or two of that, she's lost weight, she won't eat. Yeah. And uh, I said, Mom, you're losing weight. I ain't eating. I said, you got to eat. I ain't eating. You won't help me. I can't, I can't do nothing. It won't help me. So I leaned over. I said, well, let me tell you like this, mama. I said, there's a good chance if you don't start eating, they may put a feeding tube in. Ain't going to be a thing I can do about it. You need to eat. So we turned around. We're talking. Some aunt and uncle was there. We was visiting. Out the corner of my eye, I seen that little hand get a little spoon. Yeah. She dipped it in that pudding. She started. Yeah. She did an old. She did an old bowl of pudding yeah. and a half of mashed potatoes. Yeah. She been eating pretty good ever since. Yeah. Hallelujah. I tell you, it might not always be when I felt God said I'm going to take care of this thing and then I get even worse news. God's going to move. I'm going to take care of this and then you get bad news. That's the way it was for Gideon. God said I'm going to deliver million into your hands and then he takes 10,000 more men away from him. You see what it's like? You see what it's like to be in the battle and you're praying and you're trusting God. You're trying to believe God. I told God the other day, I said, God, I'm trying to believe you. I'm trying to trust you. I don't know how you're going to do it. I don't like what I see. It's hurting me. It's hard to believe it, but I'm going to believe it anyway. Sometimes you just got to keep on fighting. You might be faint, but you got to keep pursuing. You might be worn out, but you got to keep fighting. God said you got to keep going and you'll win the victory today. So some of our battles are not just about the battle themselves, but battles many times are to teach us to worship. Amen. Now coming in on Sunday morning in an air-conditioned church, maybe a little over air conditioned for some people, <laughs> but an air-conditioned church in the summertime, heated in the winter, padded pews to keep your tushies off. When you come in and you say, praise the Lord, you ain't worshiping. The devil can do that. Yeah. I've seen the devil do it, or at least yeah. some of his people. Yeah. You didn't catch that, but we'll let yeah. that go yeah. some other day. Yeah. But worship yeah. is when you're in the midst of the diverse circumstances right. and everything tells you it's not going to work out, it's impossible for anything good to come out of this. Worship tells you you're going to keep on you're going to keep on serving God. Worship says, though he slay me, yet am I going to trust in him. Hallelujah to God. That was God's plan all along. And you see, even before it happened, when God spoke to Gideon, the Bible tells us in chapter 7, verse 15, as soon as Gideon heard this, he worshiped. Hallelujah to God. I'm trying to learn in my life every time I get bad news, every time I'm expecting the good and something slow, me, unexpectedly. I'm trying to learn. That's the time I got to worship. That's the time I got to praise. Hallelujah to God today. Give him a hand clap of praise. 
say it's God's plan all along that we can see He alone yeah. is able to bring us victory. And He promised us to deliver us in a way that only He can deliver us. You see, Gideon clearly had his eyes heavenwardly as he sent the soldiers home, over, well, 12,000 of them. It reduced his army by more than half. So now Gideon has an army of 10,000 men against 100,000. Who may want to go into that battle? The odds were against them. But God does something else to surprise Gideon. He's going to encourage him, right? He's going to send him some good news, right? The Lord spoke to Gideon with his 12,000 men. He said, there's still too many. Amen. What you talking about, Lord? You done took us down halfway. Gideon must have been beside himself. But God was clearly up to something. You know what Gideon did? He did exactly what God told him to do. God said, you take these men down to the water hole. And when you get them down to the watering hole, he said, I'm going to separate them there for you. It wasn't Gideon that separated them, but God. When they got down to the water and hold, some of the men got down and they took water in their hand and they lapped it like a dog. Other men just ran and got down and put their face in the water and drank it like that. And God said, I want you to take the men that put the water in their hand and lapped it like a dog. I want you to put them to the side. All those that ran and threw their face in the water, send them home. Send them home. Do you ever wonder why that? God said, you send them home. Those men that ran to the water, they were so thirsty. Yeah. I'm not criticizing them. I'm not judging them. No. But they were so thirsty that when they got to that water, they just, all they had on their mind was water. Yeah. All they had on their mind was taking care of me. All they had on their mind was taking care of my needs. But those men that put the water in their hand and it like a dog, they were God's special. He was making a special unit. He was making a special forces unit because those men, even though they satisfied their thirst, they was keeping an eye. They were still in the battle. They knew where they were. God said, send those other men home. Now he's down to 300 men. 300 against 100,000. Now I don't know what Gideon said, but I don't know what Larry Holbrook would have said. I keep following the Lord, ain't gonna be nobody fighting with me. <laughs> Lesson number one, limited resources don't limit God. Amen. Lesson number two, discouragement can hinder you, but it'll never stop God's ultimate plan Amen. to bring victory. Ain't we all been discouraged? Amen. Don't we sometimes get discouraged in the battle? Don't we sometimes get down when things is, you know, it's a little easier on church on Sunday morning when people's patting you back and singing the praises of the Lord and you feel the Spirit. But when you're out there on Thursday evening there ain't nobody around and you're not feeling the Lord and the enemy's coming in at you like a flood, it's a little bit harder to keep your head up. So God sends all these men home but 300. And God sent Gideon and his 300 man unit forward into battle. And you know what? A long story short, they won the battle. Yeah. Yeah. The Bible said the next morning, that's the little extra part I, I wanted to read when he comes into Sukkoth and Penuel. Love that story. They come into the town. First they came in to the men of Ephraim and asked them to come down and help fight. And So they just win a battle, 300 men against 100,000. And what does Ephraim do? They complain. They criticize. What have you done to us when you went to fight the media that you didn't call for us? How crazy was that? Gideon just defeated with uh, 85,000 soldiers with 300 men. And you're being criticized by the couch potatoes that was laying at the house watching Bonanza. Yeah. <laughs> Why didn't you call us? We would have fought with you. Boy, it's easy to say after the fight's over. Yes. Come on. Yeah. Easy to fight when, the, when it's over. They were questioning Gideon's leadership. The Bible said in chapter uh, 8 verse 1, they accused him fiercely. I mean, they was mad at him. 
The scene is easier to understand if you put yourself in Gideon's shoes when you think about it. Sometimes our most disheartening, our most soul-draining, energy-sapping experiences are not on the battlefield of life, but sometimes it's right in the church. Yeah. It's right in our own spiritual family. I expect to be criticized from the people outside. I expect to be criticized from the enemy, but you cut off, we caught off guard when it comes from your brothers and sisters. How many times have we found that? It's hard enough. I'm fighting the devil over here with one hand. I've got my brothers and sisters trying to fight me over here, trying to criticize what I'm doing because they, say, they can't see everything I'm going through. All they see is what they see on Sunday morning. But can I tell you, just keep on fighting. Don't worry about the critics. Don't worry about those that don't know what's going on in your life. Keep fighting the devil. You might be faint, but keep on pursuing today. I like how Gideon lost my hanky. I like how Gideon responded to these critics. He wasn't going to be discouraged. He didn't have time for that kind of junk. Didn't have time for that kind of fight. If you remember in the text that I read to you, he called for Ephraim after they were pursuing already to come down and to catch these guys that had escaped, obeyed at Zeba. And Ephraim comes down, they block them off from the waterfronts, and they catch them and they kill them. So notice the expertise of Gideon to stop all this fussing. He said, what am I compared to you? You called old Bed and Ziba. Man, you are something else. I am no comparison to how good you are. People try to criticize you, want to run you down, put you down. You know what? Puff them up a little bit. Make them feel good about themselves. You know, if you're going to lie, lie up. That's what I say. So, but there's a battle to be fought. You're chasing the fighting the enemy, but fighting also comes from within. But you see, there's a time to, for a battle to be fought. And we've got to discern as Christian leaders. I don't have time to get, people ask me ask over the years, many times, as a pastor, certain things be going on, certain little get, 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 get be flaring up. Why, I mean, you know, why don't you do this as a pastor? Why don't you say that? Why don't you lie? I don't have time for that junk. Amen. you got to pick out your own battles. I am in a more severe battle than to worry about what color your afghan is or whether we put tulips or roses on the pit. I don't have time for that junk. Y'all fight over it if you want to. There's a battle being fought out here. And that's what Gideon said. I ain't got time to fight with you. There's an enemy out here against the nation of Israel. What a draining day it must have been for Gideon and all of his men. And it happened in a 24-hour span. Lost over more than half of his army. The intense preparation of warfare coming against 100,000 warriors. And only the next morning did Gideon get a break, if you can call it that. And during this little span of a break, his own people is fighting against him. Here's the point. At the end of a long day, sometimes God has the battle that God has been preparing you for is only the beginning. When you think you're wore out and you can't fight no more, it may just be the beginning. And when we count the cost to follow Jesus, you better expect to have some long days. If you're going to follow the Lord, you better expect to have some tension and some stress and some sleepless nights, all night battles. Got to give us breaks on occasion. So that we don't go beyond our own strength. But we can expect to feel spent and depleted. But I can guarantee you this is your pastor. When you feel like you've lost it all and you've been depleted. There's no more strength and there's no more help. There's nothing can come out of this. God will give you that strength and revive you in his own time. Amen. Now Gideon has a little more exhaustion to face. From his own people. He and his men are pursuing the Midianites. They came back to Sukkoth. When he comes to Sukkoth, his men are wore out. They're starving to death. They're faint. They've been probably fighting for 15, 24 hours at a time. And they're, they're tired and hungry. So they come into the little city of Sukkoth and they said, uh, Can you give my men some bread? The men says, uh, or the Bible, the, he said they come into Sukkoth and they're pursuing. They're faint, but they're still pursuing. They never quit the battle. They were hungry, but they never quit the battle. 
So when he comes in the men of Sukkot, he said, we ain't giving you no bread. Gideon says, you got to remember, this guy's hungry. And he's tired. He's been fighting. These guys have been laid up watching TV. He says, when I deliver these kings of Midian, I'm coming back. And I'm going to take the briars and the thistles. And I'm going to teach you a lesson. So he goes on to the next city. Remember, he don't have time to fight. His men could probably destroy that city. But that ain't the fight that we're fighting for. The enemy will try to get us away from the main fight just to wear us out and defeat us. But don't get your mind on these little bitty battles when you're trying to fight the big battle. Yeah, so he goes to the next town. Penuel, I think it was. And uh, says the same thing. Can you get something to eat? Some bread from a man? Said, we ain't giving you nothing. He didn't say when we get these guys, when we catch these kings, I'm coming back and I'm going to tear this tower down. I love this guy, Gideon. He was a little shy in the, in the beginning. You remember when the Lord called him? He said, who am I? I ain't nobody. I'm the least of my father's house. But now he's saying, boys, when I get back, I'm going to jerk the briars out of the ground and wear your rear end out with them. Hallelujah. Don't you like that kind of guy? If I got somebody fighting with me, if I got somebody leading me, I want somebody that's going to fight to the end. I want somebody that's going to defend me to the end. Amen. Gideon never let go of the mission. He kept on going. And I believe Gideon, God was telling him, you keep fighting. You fight for your children. You fight for your family. You fight for your church. You fight for your people. You fight for your city. I've already given you the victory. But you got to trust me. you got to keep going. And I believe God's saying the same thing in your battle. Maybe you're in a relationship that's become tense. Things are just getting worse. Maybe your future ain't looking too good. Maybe God is speaking to you like he did the 300. I want you to set your heart and your mind to battle an enemy that's ten times bigger than you. You can't overcome the enemy on your own. But if you'll take up your cross and follow me, I'll fight for you. The fact is that every battle that we face has an eternal purpose. Yes. Me and mom's talked since she's been there in the hospital. And I said, Mom, I don't know. I don't understand the plan of God. Got a lot of questions, but I'm not, I'm not questioning God. I know we've got an enemy. I said, but God's got a greater purpose than you just being here. That's right. And I can't tell you the people that's come into that room that mom's already ministered to. We were standing there praying for her yesterday when Brother Mark and Sister Jackie was there. And uh, we gathered around her and we was praying just like we pray here in church. And the little nurse cleaning lady was standing at the door and we got through and she said, all my life I've never seen that. I said, huh? And she said, I've never seen. She said, usually I see people come in here, four or five of them, and one person prays. Everybody just stands there. She said, but I've never heard everybody praying. I said, we believe in who we're praying to. And now she didn't necessarily call her pastor a big mouth. She just said, I know who had the dominant voice. I think that's, I think that's the way she said it. But we was praying like we mean it. And mom said, when I get out of here, I'm going to volunteer places like this, and I'm going to help people going through this. I said, see, mom, God's got a purpose. God, everything in our life is about God. We make it about us, but it's about God. It's about God and what God's doing in our life. We can't overcome the enemy by ourselves. No. God's telling us that we need to trust Him over our own capabilities. He provides us the strength to get us through the battle when we feel like that we can't make it any farther. I guarantee you, you can. You'll make it as far as God wants you to go. I've been at times that I thought, Lord, I can't go another day. I can't go another step. I can't make it through this, but I found out that I did. I'm here today, amen, and I'm learning to trust him every day. I might be wore out, I might be tired, I might be faint, but I'm keeping pursuing, amen, amen. hallelujah. And that's my word to you today. You might be tired, you might be down in the battle, you might be wore out fighting this battle. Some people fight battles for weeks, some people fight battles for months, some even been in it for years, but they keep on fighting. They might be faint, but they're still pursuing. I'm telling you, as long as you're pursuing God, he's giving you that strength to pursue. Keep on pursuing that enemy because God is going to give you victory today. So here's the idea of the message before I close. We're not a people that's called of God to seek comfort and pleasure and to have every blessing just handed to us. Some churches that I see sometimes, I don't watch churches on TV anymore, Facebook or nothing like that. I just get, I get so tired of all these churches just telling us just 
Everything's about a blessing. Everything's about a shout. Everything's about if you ask it, he'll give it. You know what? I've asked for a lot of things I didn't get. Huh? And they want to uh, try to excuse God and, and explain. But God don't need our excuses. He don't need somebody to defend him. I think sometimes we got our theology wrong. We get our understanding and our, and our, our, our faith is misconstrued. God's not just called us to be blessed. We're called to battle. Amen. We're called to fight. And why does a lot of people come to church, give the life of the Lord, and never see them again? A lot of different reasons, but there's a lot of them just don't want to fight. That's right. They don't want to fight. Yep. Now, I remember something. I don't remember where I read it or seen it, but I always keep it in my mind. I would rather fight for my freedom than to live peacefully in bondage. Amen. That's what they're trying to do to these United States. Amen. Trying to put you in bondage, send you all this money so you won't work, stay home, be lazy, we'll feed you. But when they feed you and take care of you, you'll do what they say to do. You'll have the church they give you. They'll have the religion they give you. Amen. Have at it, baby. I'll fight until the end. I'm going to fight for my freedom. Amen. So God is in control. <laughs> But even though he's in control, he asks us to act in faith because the purposes are eternal. We've got to get on our knees. We've got to pray. We've got to stay in his word. Yes. We've got to stay in his word. We've got to be faithful to church. We've got to be faithful to worship. Whatever he calls us to do, he'll give us the strength to accomplish it. Yes. And only when we do, Will the Lord see God for who he is? Yes. You see, God is wanting the world to see him through you. Amen. And as your life changes and you serve him and you're all in serving God, if you make your life about God instead of you, yeah. people will start seeing God in your life. Amen. 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 Will you stand with us all over the house?